Hello, everybody, and welcome to SPI's webinar. I am Sandy Williams, President at Access Biomedical Solutions and Biomedical Engineering and Marketing Consultant for SPI. I will be moderating the webinar today and facilitate the Q&A session. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Jake Boy, who is an application scientist at SBI. Today, he's going to talk to us about intelligent dynamic cell culture with optical sensors. Jake has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Organismic and Evolutionary Biology from Harvard University and research lab experience in genetics and cell culture. As an application scientist at SBI, he spends most of his time talking with customers about how they can best leverage optical sensors in their cultures. So don't hesitate to send in your questions for him. Jake, take it away. Okay, Sandy, thank you very much for that introduction. And welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're happy to have you. Today's presentation will be about intelligent dynamic cell culture with optical sensors. So first, I'd like to talk a little bit about our company and where we come from and who we are. So Scientific Bioprocessing, SBI for short, is a subsidiary of Scientific Industries. Scientific Industries is a company that's been around since the 50s, and they're the creators of the Vortex Genie, which I'm sure that many of you have seen in your labs. Um, we have collaboration partners at UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, with Dr. Rao and the cast crew. At UMBC, they develop sensors like dissolved oxygen sensors, pH sensors, CO2, and glucose. And SBI helps to commercialize and further the technology. So as a sensor company, SBI has four things in mind that we think every cell scientist should expect from their sensing technology. First, the sensor should be reliable. They should provide automatic control in a closed feedback loop. Um, they should be able to provide and maintain relevant physiological parameters at the cellular level. And cellular level is something really important that we're going to talk about quite a bit today. And then finally, they should be inexpensive or economically remarkable, as we like to say. So optical sensors, what are they? It's sort of a new technology, something that not many people are familiar with. And I, I mean, I'm sure many of you are used to electrochemical probes, um, the bulkier probes that people typically use in bioreactor systems. But unfortunately, these are not suitable probes or methods of sensing for things like T flasks and other small scouting devices. So optical sensors are a new technology that are easily um, equipable in vessels like T flasks um, spinner flasks, shake flasks, small vessels like this that are used to scout process, um, scout experimental design and to troubleshoot during scale down and also for scale up. So right now, um, because traditional sensors don't work in things like T flasks, there's a gap in cell culture knowledge about certain parameters while cultivating cells in a T flask or a shake flask, something like that. Right now, there's really no reliable way to get dissolved oxygen or pH sensing in vessels like these. And you can imagine a large elect electrochemical probe is not suitable for sticking down into the neck of a tea flask with a low fill, fill vol volume and also something like offline sensing where you have a low fill volume to begin with and you don't want to be taking samples. And then, you know, people know things like um, during offline sensing, whenever you take a sample, the oxygen level changes by the time you get it to where you actually can sense how much oxygen is in that sample that you took. It's not representative of what the cells are experiencing. So introducing the ID developers kit. This is an SBI product and you can see it pictured here on the left. This kit is perfect for taking measurements of dissolved oxygen and pH in vessels like the ones you see pictured there. There's a shake flask, a multi-well plate, a glass dish, petri dishes, a tea flask, vessels like these we now have reliable real-time monitoring for things like dissolved oxygen and pH in these types of vessels because of So a little bit more about optical sensors and some of their capabilities. Here's a quick spec sheet. So some really important things to highlight. These sensors are extremely accurate and consistent. The response time is very quick. Um, calibration, the sensors come pre-calibrated and can be easily recalibrated by a user with one simple step. They're sterilizable. Um, they are really, really small and what we call minimally invasive. So this is an important point that we're going to talk about a little bit later as well. But minimally invasive means that the sensors are 
already part of the culture vessel before inoculation takes place. So one never needs to open the culture vessel to take a sample or to insert a probe, anything like that that might risk contamination or disturb the cells as they're growing. The sensors are typically 10 millimeter squares, but they can be cut into custom dimensions and sizes, and they're very low profile, so about 0.32 millimeters tall. So picture a couple pieces of printer paper stacked on top of each other. So you can imagine these sensors are small and they're versatile because of this. So in this next segment, I'll talk a little bit about some studies that have been done using optical sensors, and these studies will help to illustrate the gap in cell culture knowledge, where that gap exists, why that gap is important, and then finally, how optical sensors can help to address this gap and to fix this issue. So before we start, I'd like to define KLA. For those who don't know, KLA is a volumetric mass transfer coefficient. And the way that it's relevant in the context that we're using it here in these studies, KLA is talking about the ability of the liquid media to transfer gas from the from the incubator, from the headspace gas phase down to where the cells are growing in a culture vessel. So imagine a tea flask sitting in a CO2 incubator with a specific gas environment. That gas environment is in the headspace of that tea flask. Then there's a liquid media layer, and then there's a layer at the very bottom where the adherent cells are growing on the bottom of the tea flask. KLA refers to the ability of that gas layer to reach those cells through the liquid media. So first, the first study that we're going to look at, the scientists wanted to find out which small culture vessel would be the most ideal for matching the KLA in a 10 liter wave bioreactor. So we're talking about here, something like a T25, T75, T150. They also look at spinner flasks um, and shake flasks to find out which, which flasks had the most representative KLA of what you would experience upon scaling up. So like I talked about before, there's really no way to know what's happening inside of a tea flask as far as oxygen is concerned, as far as pH is concerned. So how could you really know the KLA? Optical sensors were used to help show this. Optical sensors were the way that these scientists were able to gather this data to determine that tea flasks were actually the most scalable device in terms of KLA to a 10 liter wave bioreactor. The reason for this is because tea flasks have the best surface area to volume ratio of the liquid media. What this means is that the gas is able to diffuse across this larger surface area compared to the volume of the media, opposed to other flask types that have a smaller surface area and deeper fill volumes. But there's a convenient assumption that cell culture scientists typically make. And that assumption is that, that, assumption is that if you have a tea flask sitting in a CO2 incubator with a very specific gas environment, that gas environment is getting down to my cells where they're growing, right? Unfortunately, this is not the case. That liquid media layer, no matter how low that, that fill volume is, that liquid media layer act, acts as an insulator between that gas and the paracellular level where those cells are actually growing. As the cells metabolize, as they grow, they're using oxygen and they're excelling CO2. And what happens is that oxygen gets used up more quickly than that liquid media allows oxygen to be transferred down to where the cells are growing. Oxygen has a very low solubility in media. The other negative effect is that the CO2 is heavy and it builds up and sits right on top of those cells and does not allow oxygen to reach the cells. And it also lowers the pH, making your culture more acidic. So this is a pretty busy slide, um, but the graphic here is really just showing what I talked about with showing that tea flasks are the most scalable in terms of KLA to a 10 liter wave bioreactor. And, and the way that this graphic is working, we wanna focus on figure 5A on the top left. It's showing that as surface area to volume ratio decreases, the performance of these culture, vessel, culture vessels also decreases. And then Reynolds number, which is talking about the flow. So going from laminar to turbulent flow in types of flask. And as that number increases, um, the T-flask T -flask is still able to outperform these other vessel types. So the T-flask was ideal to use for this experiment, and the experimenters were able to figure this out using optical sensors in these culture vessels to put them to the test. So the key takeaway, rocking T-flask, and rocking, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute here, um, some agitation that the, that the researchers decided to use. So rocking T-flasks have superior oxy oxygen transfer capabilities against other small culture vessel types and a better KLA at lower flow rates, so at lower Reynolds values. 
So talking a little bit about biotech here, um, before we get into the next study, I want to point out something that I'm sure many of you are aware of and that many of you are thinking about right now. The FDA is pushing for this initiative called the PAT initiative. And the idea behind this is to have as much control and as much data from the very beginning of every experiment all the way through the end. And this is important because as biotech advances and tries to push to become an integrated part of the medical field, these processes need to be controlled and ultimately approved by organizations like the FDA before they can be approved medically. And so the PAT initiative is just trying to gather as much data about as many parameters as we possibly can while we're growing ourselves from the very beginning to the very end of our experiments, as well as the scale down phase, as well as before we scale up. And optical sensors help to provide data in these scenarios. So now we'll talk about a study, and um, this is a really, really interesting study, and it may be a surprise to some of you. So what we're seeing here is a graph, a couple of graphs, and in both of these graphs are being shown a T225 flask. So a T flask sitting statically in an incubator, like many people currently grow their cells. And I'm sure a lot of you have experience with this as well. Oh, if I crack the lid of this T flask, the gas will get into those cells and they'll be able to grow effectively, right? But unfortunately, this is not the case. So we see on the right in figure five, a T flask statically going in an incubator with a closed cap. And you can see that after a little more than two days, the dissolved oxygen level is approaching zero. And then in a T flask where the lid is actually cracked and partially open, it's the same thing. The dissolved oxygen level is approaching zero. What this means is that in only two days, your T flask with your cell culture in that CO2 incubator is becoming hypoxic. Your cells are being starved of oxygen. And another thing to keep in mind, this is with a four millimeter liquid depth. So these T225 flasks are being filled with only four millimeters of media. And still that gas, that gas layer is not being able to transfer through that static liquid layer down to where the cells need the oxygen. So the important takeaway here is that even T flasks are not ideal if they're sitting statically in an incubator for growing cells. And then this, again, this study was able to happen because optical sensors were used in this T flask to illustrate this very, very important point. People grow, T, grow cells in T flasks, in incubators, in this scenario all the time. And most people are not aware because sensing is not available, not aware that their cells are being starved of oxygen. Real-time monitoring with optical sensors showed us this insight. So the scientists know now that the T flasks are overwhelmingly liquid phase mass transfer limited. What that means, the media is an insulator that does not allow that gas phase to reach the cells where they're growing. So the authors have an idea. Something that they can do is maybe provide some gentle agitation to that media to help the media mix with the gas to break up that insulating layer and to maybe get some of that gas down to where the cells are growing. So here's a layout of the experiment. And on the right, there's a busy figure here, but some important things to point out. You can see a T flask. And in that T flask, in figure B, you can see the optical sensors. You can see how small they are in this T flask. And this is inside of a CO2 incubator. And the scientists, the researchers, placed this entire unit on a rocking platform in the CO2 incubator so that the platform would rock back and forth and gently agitate that media in hopes they could mix up that insulating layer and allow the gas to reach the cells as they were growing. And again, this is a T75, and I'd like to point out how small these sensors are inside of a T75. And so the results of this study are pretty astounding. Um, and some key takeaways from this. So the cell cultures grew much more quickly and much more densely in rocking T flasks as opposed to static flasks. They had higher densities. They produced 25% less lactate in these rocking flasks. And the dissolved oxygen in the rocking flask never reached below 70%. And the pH remained much more physiologically relevant as these cells grew. So we'll dive into these figures a little bit more here. Figure D, this is the figure tracking the pH. So this is using an optical sensor to, re to get monitoring in real time of the pH of this cell culture as this culture was growing. On the bottom, um, the x-axis, we have time in hours. The y-axis is the pH. The black line 
is a static T flask, a T75 in a CO2 incubator. And the red line is the rocking T flask, again, a T75 in a CO2 incubator. So as you can see, the pH in the static flask was well below that physiological hotspot that we like around between 7 and 7.4, somewhere in there. Those cells love pH that's around that range. But the static T flask dropped well below 7.4 in only a couple of days and was never able to recover. The rocking T flask was able to maintain physiologically relevant levels of pH throughout the experiment. So much better performance than a T flask that's sitting statically. And again, this has a lot to do with mixing the media, getting that CO2 that's built up on the cells as they metabolize and mixing that CO2 away so that the cells do not become so acidic as they're growing. Another really important thing and a nice note here is that because of this physiologically relevant pH that the cells were kept in, they produced a 31% antibody, higher antibody titer than the static flask. So the implication here is that cells really like these physiological conditions as opposed to just being growing out on their own without the sensing, without something being done about these acidic conditions that are occurring. So here we'll zoom in on figure C. This is similar to the last figure, but this is talking about dissolved oxygen. Again, the x-axis is time and hours. The y-axis is levels of dissolved oxygen. The black line is the static T75 in the CO2 incubator, and the red line is the rocking flask, the T75 in the CO2 incubator. So this is some pretty striking data, and it has a lot of implications. The static T flask, after only 48 hours, so two days, became hypoxic with the cells in the T75. Those cells were being starved of oxygen after only two days of growing statically in a T flask in an incubator. The rocking T flask was able to maintain levels of dissolved oxygen that never dipped below 70% throughout the duration. So this is showing what the data is showing. Using these optical sensors, we can see that gentle agitation in a T flask actually allows the cells to maintain a consistent level of physiologically relevant levels of dissolved oxygen as they're growing. So again, this is when I would like to talk a little bit about some convenient assumptions that cell culture scientists make. And many of us have been there, you know, I know I've been there in the past when I've been culturing cells and something that, you know, so normally we have our cell packaging and on a Friday we might say, okay, it's okay if I leave my cells there and I'll pass them on Monday, they'll be fine. But what this data is showing is those two days and your cells are hypoxic by the time you get back into the lab on Monday. So hypoxia is when the cells don't have enough oxygen, but there are many different cell types and different cell types have different relevant levels of dissolved oxygen in which they like to grow. We call this normoxic. There are many different normoxic conditions relevant to different cell types. They vary widely. But what optical sensors allow you to do is track oxygen levels in real time so that you can maintain those norm normoxic conditions for your specific cell type that you're growing so those cells can grow in the most physiologically relevant conditions and they can produce as optimally as possible. So an important note here is that hypoxia, when cells are outside of that normoxic level as they're growing, they actually experience DNA damage, and you may have genetic instability in your cell culture by the time you're finished with your experiment. So mo the, the implication here, which is a huge implication, is that monitoring a dissolved oxygen profile and being able to control that profile in something like a T flask is really important to increase your cell line genetic stability. So the next study here talks about a rocking T flask, a T75, and how it can match the KLA of a 10, lead, 10 liter cultibag wave bioreactor. And this is just some really, really interesting data. So the implication here is that, you know, if you're working on scaling up your experiment and you're use, using something like a wave bioreactor, something as large as 10 liters, you can actually accurately scout that device and scout your experiment and tweak your experiment using something as small as a T75. This saves a lot on media. You know, you don't have to waste as much cell culture media, which everyone knows is very expensive. It saves time during your experiments because you can control these parameters in these small flasks, and then you have a reliable answer as to what's going to happen when you scale up. So if we look at figure C, 
we can see that uh, call to the call to bag and the 275 flask maintain similar, similar levels of dissolved oxygen throughout an experiment. In figure D, we see the same for pH. The call to bag in red, the rocking tea flask in black, and you can see that the pH tracks very well for both of those devices. And then at the very bottom, in figure E, the protein titer. This is probably the most interesting one of all, that in a T75, you can have, if that T75 is rocking and equipped with, with sensing that is able, that allows you to control the environment in, the, in that T flask, you can have a titer that is similar and scalable to a 10 liter wave bioreactor in something as small as a T75. So now we talked a little bit about some of the issues with cell culture, the gap that exists in small culture vessels where we don't really know what's happening with our dissolved oxygen and our pH as our cells are growing in things like tea flasks and shake flasks and spinner flasks. These devices that we use to test our experimental design before we scale up, these devices that we use to troubleshoot our experiments during scale down. So now that we have all the sensing, now that we know what our oxygen levels are and what our pH levels are in these types of devices, what can we do with that information? SBI has a whole suite of products that help us to address these issues using optical sensors and making use of this sensing. So the first thing I'll talk about is one of our most fundamental products called the ID reader. This reader, just to give you an idea of the size because the image doesn't have anything really for scale, but it's 90 millimeters in diameter and 15 millimeters tall. So similar to the size of a hot puck. And this device is what actually sends the fluorescence up to the sensor patches so that they can take a reading that is then interpreted as an oxygen reading or a pH reading. Now, some important notes about this device. The most important thing I think of all is that this is a sterilizable device that can be used inside or outside of a cell culture incubator. So it can withstand temperatures up to 50 degrees Celsius, typically 37 degrees is where people will be running their experiments. But what you can do with this is wipe it down with ethanol to sterilize it, place it inside of your incubator, and place your tea flask with optical sensors on top of this device so that you can get readings as to the dissolved oxygen levels and the pH levels inside of your tea flask as your cell culture grows in your incubator. Another great feature about this device is that each one of them has two sensing channels. What this means is that you can take pH readings and dissolved oxygen readings with just one device. You can also take two pH readings or two dissolved oxygen readings with a single device if you choose to do so. These can be configured with just one click by the user. So a little bit more about the method of sensing. Um, on the left, we see a diagram here. So in yellow, we have a culture vessel with some protons floating around and some oxygen molecules flo floating around. And then we see pictured the optical sensor adhered to the bottom of the culture vessel. So the way it works, the optical sensors have a silicone adhesive on the back of them. They're stuck to the wall or the bottom of the culture vessel, anywhere you want to on the culture vessel, really. And then the culture vessel is actually sterile to begin with, or it's sterilized along with the sensor. Media is then poured in and cells are inoculated in that vessel. That vessel is placed on top of the reader that we just showed, and that reader sends light through the wall of the culture vessel to fluoresce off of the sensor patch to then take a reading of dissolved oxygen or pH. So a lot of times bioreactor companies will want a different form factor because that reader form factor is not, is not very suitable for their bioreactor. So we have equipped the reader with fiber optics. So these fiber optics allow for a huge versatility in the use of this device. The fiber optic cables, um, we typically run them about a meter long, but they can be as long or short as you want, depending on your experiment or your, your application. They're three millimeters in diameter, so they allow for sensor spots that are as small as four millimeters in diameter. And you can place these sensors remotely anywhere you want to in your culture vessel. This allows sensing in a wide variety of bioreactor form factors, as well as culture vessels and different uses for different types of culture vessels. So again, just a, a closer look at what this device looks like. Um, and some important things, some use cases that we have, um, some examples of how people are using this fiber optic enabled reader. So you can imagine that you have a bioreactor or culture vessel that has a headspace where the gas layer is sitting above media. You could place an, a dissolved oxygen sensor 
to the wall of that culture vessel in that gas layer so they can work in dry environments. And then you can place another dissolved oxygen sensor at the paracellular level. So where the cells are growing below the media and you can run a fiber optic cable to each one of these sensors to simultaneously get readings to compare the level of oxygen in that gas layer in that headspace and to compare the oxygen level to what the cells are actually experiencing underneath the media. So you can see in real time the difference between what your cells are experiencing as opposed to the environment that you're creating in your incubator or in your bioreactor headspace. Another great way that these cables can be used, we have a device that occupies the port space of something like a bioreactor or a wave bag and you can insert in just an eight millimeter diameter device you can get dissolved oxygen and ph sensing in this port that we use with this device so you have sensing and you want to now use that sensing to optimize your process. You want to make sure your, your cells are as healthy and physiologically relevant throughout your experiment as possible. So now we'll talk about some devices that we have that provide this environmental control. So the first device is called the ID rocker. And we talked a lot in this presentation about rocking and gentle agitation of something like a tea flask. This instrument here is designed to go inside of an incubator and it's designed to house several geometries of T-Flask. Here we see a T25, a T75, and two T150s on this platform. And what this device does is it allows those T-Flasks to gently rock on this platform as your cells are growing to, again, break up that insulating liquid layer so that your cells are actually experiencing the gas environment that is in your CO2 incubator. Another really great thing with this device, it allows your cells to mechanically respire, if you will. It allows your cells to call for their own oxygen. You can set a dissolved oxygen set point, and as your cells metabolize, as they grow and proliferate, they use up oxygen that is in that media, and once that oxygen level reaches that set point, then the device will begin rocking to increase the level of dissolved oxygen so that your cells never fall below a certain level that you decide. Again, this is all enabled with the optical sensors that you flex. The next device is the ID shaker. So almost everyone knows about shaker tables and how to use them. But the real magic with the shaker table that we provide is this adapter that you can see in the very center of, of the picture that allows a shake flask to sit securely on top of an ID reader. And that shake flask would have the sensors, the optical sensors affixed to the bottom of it. And then you close up, you inoculate, you close the lid, and you never have to open the lid of that shake flask again as you monitor the level of oxygen and pH that's occurring in your cell culture in that shake. The next device, the ID reactor. So this device is great for scaling up. So this is like a mini bioreactor. And uh, just to give you an idea of the size, so those vessels there that you see, the three vessels on the left, those have a 25 milliliter working volume. So very small. This is a benchtop device. It provides gas control. It provides temperature control all independently. So again, these glass vessels here have impellers on the inside that's constantly doing a stirring. And the device has optical sensors affixed to the bottom of these vessels that are being read and monitored in real time as the experiment takes place. So this device is great for scaling up to a larger bioreactor vessel. So we have all of these devices and we have all of this sensing, but now we need a way to view it and to display it and to get and to log our data. So um, SBI offers the ID Data Hub as our software suite. The software is really great for a couple of reasons. First, it allows you to log data for as long as you want to. You can log data for your, from your experiment for a day, for a week, for a month, even longer if you want to. And you can log that data, you can get all of that sensing data and review it later to help optimize your process, to tweak your experimental design before you decide to scale up or on a scale down experiment during troubleshooting, something like that. You can gather all of the sensing data in these small devices to figure out what's really going on. It also offers some really, uh, some really interactive, nice graphical displays. So in real time, you can see uh, graphically represented what's happening to your dissolved oxygen and pH as your cell culture is growing. Some other nice features, um, the software allows for readings to be taken every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, you can get readings about 
updates for your dissolved oxygen and your pH levels in your cell culture. So it's really, really is real time monitoring. The software also provides a one step recalibration if recalibration is necessary for your sensors. So just some places um, where these sensors fit in in the world. And we'll talk a little bit about bioprocessing and therapeutics here. Um, so I've talked about this quite a bit, but I mean, I can't harp on it enough. Scale up is, is so important and these sensors allow you to scale up more effectively, more optimally, more quickly, more economically than ever before. So you can have as much control as possible. You can have as much information as possible before you scale up your experiment, before you start getting expensive, before you start getting into real runs. And with optical sensors, you're reducing contamination. You're reducing the amount of time you need to dedicate to your cell cultures and small devices. And you're able to use small devices and actually track levels of oxygen and pH in these small devices before you scale up. Scale down, very similar. If your process is running, but it has a bottleneck somewhere, you need to troubleshoot. You need to scale back and figure out what's happening in your bioreactor that, that seems to be going wrong or just some pain point that you want to fix. You can equip these optical sensors in a small device during scale down to help you more quickly reach that answer so that you can get back to running your process. Also manufacturing. So these, these sensors are single use. So they're great for things like bioreactors that are meant to be away after the run so the sensors are very inexpensive they can be equipped in bioreactors that are used in at a manufacturing scale and the sensors um, are minimally invasive um, th so they reduce contamination in these large-scale experiments and they allow you to control parameters like never before to medicine and clinical manufacturing so again um, research and development this is another big one so if you're trying to design an experiment, if you're trying to run an entire experiment in something like a multi-well plate or something like a T, then you can do that using these sensors. So it's, again, you're saving on media, you're saving time by not having to get what's happening with your dissolved oxygen and your pH. You don't have to wait to see your media turn a golden color. Um, you can actually track your pH levels in real time instead of having to visually see the media change. This is also great for in vitro models like organ on a chip. Like I said before, these sensors are extremely, extremely small and minimally invasive and can kind of be stuck anywhere. So you can use them in various form factors, something as small as organ on a chip with the fiber optic enabled ID reader. So I've talked a lot about pH sensors. I've talked a lot about dissolved oxygen sensors, but we have a lot of plans for the future. In the future, in, in um, collaboration with UMBC, we're working on glucose sensor, glutamine sensor, and a CO2 sensor that we'll be providing in the very near future. So here's the bibliography full of all the references um, that we talk about throughout the entirety of this presentation. And with that, I would like to um, up to your imagination. Think about some of the uses of these sensors, some of the data, some of the insights that have been provided, some of the things we talked about, and hopefully we can find a way to help you optimize your cell culture process in the future. I thank you everyone for listening, and with that, I am open to questions. Well, thank you, Jake, for a great presentation, and also thank you to Dr. Govind Rao from UMBC and his collaborators and students for these um, very well-designed and impactful research studies. So we have a few questions. First question is, can I reuse the sensors if I have only used them for a short experiment? These sensors are meant to be single use. They're not meant to be reused. So the, the whole point of this is that they're really inexpensive. You use them for your experiment and then you throw the whole thing away and you don't have to worry about it again. Okay, great. Um, another question is how far uh, do you have to place this, the, the reader from the sensors and, and still get a good reading? Right. And this is a great question. It's very relevant because with optical sensing, we are reading through the wall of a culture vessel. So we call that standoff distance. And the standoff distance that is allowable from the ID reader to where the sensor patches are affixed in a vessel is one centimeter. So if the wall of your culture vessel is one centimeter thick, we can get accurate readings through through something like that. Anything smaller than that, is fine as well. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, can you apply the ID reader to reducing scientific reproducibility problems between labs? Yes, absolutely. And that's another really important thing um, that that we like to provide with optical settings. So when we're working with things like T-flasks um, and using these optical sensors, we can get data in T-flasks about dissolved oxygen and pH. And because we have that reliable data, when we're moving from lab to lab, using these readers, using the sensing system, we can recreate those parameters um, like never before, because we actually know what those parameters are now. Great. Um, another question is the base port, will it be useful for future sensors? The base port? Um, so if I'm, if I'm taking this question correctly, um, I think the answer is yes. If you're talking about the port where we are affixing the dissolved oxygen and the pH sensors, um, other sensor types, yes, will be integrated into that port so that we can read them um, using the fiber optic system. Okay, so Richard, let us know if that's not what you meant by, by base port. Okay, yeah, he did. All right, another question. Should cell culture oxygen levels be required for reporting of cell-based findings and publications? Well, I mean, I don't think I have the authority to properly make that call. Uh, based on everything I know and based on all of the data that I've seen, I think the answer is yes. I think dissolved oxygen levels are fundamentally important to the health of the cells, um, especially in something like a stem cell differentiation application where you're taking pluripotent stem cells, you're exposing them to different parameters and different metabolites, and you're trying to differentiate them into healthy cells uh, of the type of you're choosing. So dissolved oxygen levels are extremely important for experiments like that. And like we talked about before, normoxic cell conditions. So the cells in our body experience different levels of dissolved oxygen, depending on how far they are from blood vessels or centers where oxygen is being transported through our body. That's the same thing for cells that we're growing in culture. Those cells are tuned genetically to specific levels of oxygen that are most relevant for them. So it is my belief that to do the best science possible, we should be reliably reporting levels of dissolved oxygen throughout our cell culture experience so that we know our cells are as close to real life as possible. Yeah, and if I may add uh, that this was a question from Alicia from Biospherics, and I think it's a great question because I, I do notice mm -hmm. that people report less and less in the methods section and, and papers, so it's it's hard to, to track what actually is being done. And there's also a lot of studies that show just taking your flask outside, you know, of your incubator to change the media, just the impact it has on the cells. So being able to maintain oxygen levels throughout culture, including media changes, um, that's, that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. Another question, um, in tissue engineering where scaffolds uh, mostly are used, can we measure analyte into the scaffold? And do you find interference? Right, and that's a great question. This is a question we get a lot of times. So one really great thing about these sensors is that they can be placed right where the cells are growing. And there are various methods that we've spoken about with companies before about getting these sensors integrated with a scaffolding system so that you know what those cells are experiencing as they're growing on that scaffold. So a great part about our company, um, our engineering team, we work really hard to fit various types of applications. And we always find a way to get our sensors to the location that our customer wants them. So if we want to get, integrate them into scaffolding, we can absolutely work towards that. Great. Um, a question uh, came in. Can you miniaturize the ID reader? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah, actually we can. So the ID reader is a form factor that we use because it allows something like a, a T-flask to sit stably on top of it. But the actual inside of that thing is much smaller than what you see. So we can make it a lot smaller, um, just depending on the application. And these are things that are coming in the future that we're working on internally as well. And, and you talked about the fiber optic reader, which is a step right, in that yeah. direction. Again, yeah, the fiber optic reader is a quick way to do that right now. So we have the fiber optic cables, again, are three millimeters in diameter each. Um, so we can miniaturize the reader in that sense uh, down to an eight millimeter 
diameter um, size device that we have developed that allows sensing that way. Thank you. One last question that I see here. What is the maximum time in days that an individual sensor patch can retain its integrity? Right. And this is another great question. So we've had sensors running in the lab for a couple of weeks at a time, uh, up to a month at a time. I've actually personally never seen one go bad or lose its integrity. So a week, easy. Uh, two weeks as well, that's fine. So the sensors are very reliable and they're durable over a long period of time. Great. I don't see any other questions right now, but you have Jake's contact information on the slide here. So if any questions come up afterwards, please feel free to contact him. So I would like to thank you, Jake, for this great presentation again today. Thanks everybody for joining us and stay well. Thank you everyone.